Hello, it's Scott Manley here. A couple of weeks ago, I made a video about NASA's research into lifting body aircraft, which led to the Dream Chaser. That is, aircraft which don't have wings that effectively generate all the required lift from airflow over the body. Well, this week, they made a big announcement which went in completely the opposite direction. They announced they're planning to build a full-scale scale airliner using high-aspect, big, extra-long wings to demonstrate new aerodynamic technology which will make more efficient airliners. This is a collaboration with Boeing, which is under a Space Act agreement, even although it's actually about aeronautics. You know, NASA, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, by the way, for those of you who are wondering why NASA spends money on airliners. This is going to be $425 million that gets paid to Boeing as they hit various milestones. And Boeing will have to spend... Well, they estimate $725 million of their own money. I won't be surprised if that turns out to be more. But ultimately, Boeing wants to come out of this with a more efficient airliner, which will help them in the market. Because while having a more efficient aircraft is great from an environmental impact, which makes them more green, the green that the airlines care about is the money they are spending on all that aviation fuel. And a 10% reduction is a pretty big deal. That's what they're expecting. If you have watched aviation for the last 30 years, you'll notice that all the planes you used to fly now have little wingtip devices. And those take cost millions of dollars to fit, but they reduce the drag by about, you know, a few percent. It's enough to make a difference to the operating cost of an airline. That's why everybody does it these days. So anyway, this is called the Transonic Truss Braced Wing Demonstrator. So first of all, it's a high aspect wing. That means that the wing cord is like the, the length of the wing from the front to the back, and then the span is the length of the wing going out. So aspect is the ratio of those numbers. So as you go from a low aspect, which is like a short, stubby, long wing, uh, you know, high cord wing, to make a long, thin wing, the area can remain the same, but the aspect changes. And it turns out that high aspect wings, well designed, will have better drag properties, they'll generate more lift. That's why you have gliders using these big long wings so that they can soar on the thermals without any engine power. Uh, in technical terms, it, apparently it works that they reduce the induced drag, which is the drag that you generate as you're generating lift, whereas parasitic drag is the, the type of drag you generate uh, which doesn't generate lift. So this reduces the drag on that and helps you not only fly for less power, it also in theory helps you fly higher. Take a look at the U2, for example. It has very long wingspan, in fact, so long that it has a hard time landing because it's so light. So anyway, airliners haven't used these big, long, high aspect wings, mostly for all sorts of reasons. So the design that's popular are these like box, you know, cantilever designs, which uh, are low wing and they spread out, they're swept to provide better transonic performance, but they're very thick because they have to transfer the loads all the way from the tip all the way to the body. And the thickness of the wings is actually sort of, it has its own advantages because it means the wings are thick enough that they can put fuel tanks inside them. And since a lot of the weight of an aircraft when flying is the fuel, that actually helps even more because if you've got the fuel in the wing, you don't need to figure out how to transfer the lift from the wing to the fuel because it's already there. These high, these very long aspect ratio wings are too thin to really maintain or to contain huge amounts of fuel. They require all sorts of new technologies to be able to make them sufficiently long and thin and they can only really get the load capabilities by adding in this big long truss. So the design sort of resembles what would happen if you took a passenger airliner and crossed it with a Cessna 172, where you've got the, the truss coming up and the big wing, except that the wing is, is just comically long. Um, like, we have actually seen airline designs in the past, way in the distant past, right? In France, there was a, an aircraft called the Uriel de Bois, which used a, a truss-braced uh, high-aspect design, and it was you know, more efficient than the other options. And at the time, I think Air France actually ordered a few of them. And at some point, it, everyone decided, no, wait, uh, everyone wants to go faster. Let's just cancel that order and buy jets instead. 
Uh, they did actually have a jet to uh, Dubois, but it never made it off the drawing board. So, yes, speed was the sort of the, the problem or the, the constraining factor. They didn't want to go slower. And so a lot of research that has been done on this wing in the last you know, 10 years or so has been in altering the sweep, adjusting its cape properties, making sure it doesn't flutter so they can fly at like Mach 0.8, comparable to like a 737. Uh, another problem with these long high aspect wings is that they basically are too long for existing airports as they're designed. You know, we're also already getting to aircraft plane wing limits that are, are uh, requiring some interesting design choices. If you look at the 777X, it has wingtips which are quite long that fold up so it can actually fit into its legal gate size without having to go to something bigger and larger. That gives it more lift when it's flying, but you know, lets it fit into the space. And you know, another thing, reason why aircraft were using these big thick wing designs is because material science and engineering was sort of geared towards that design for a very long time. It took like a pure research a group like NASA to actually go in and solve all the problems in their wind tunnels at uh, Langley and at Ames and of course in their computational fluid dynamics systems where they modeled these designs and optimized them. These trusses aren't just load bearing supports, they are also altering the aerodynamics of the system so that they can generate lift and cancel out drag or minimize uh, drag in that area. Um, so yeah, this design, they, they did a lot of testing over the last 10 years. The origin of this design actually goes back to NASA's like sustainable flight program, which looked at all sorts of different technologies and looked, took designs, design proposals from a number of manufacturers. Like Northrop Grumman, of course, said, look, we can take a flying wing design and put passengers inside it. And that is a radical and cool concept. But NASA didn't go that way. They liked Boeing's design because it can use a lot of existing technology and they are really just modifying the wing. In fact, this design that Boeing has spec'd out, I believe they're called the VS-1 and the VS-2, and they both use fuselage segments or fuselage based on the MD-90, right? The McDonnell Douglas 90 from the 1990s, which wasn't a hugely successful plane, but uh, they had the hardware in-house and the VS-1 would fit like 130 to 160 passengers, the VS-2 would be bigger, would be 180 to 210, and apparently they would require sufficiently different wing designs that uh, you know they would need to be optimized for each aircraft. So, the, yeah, the sustainable flight program also looked at a whole bunch of other things. It looked at, um, well, first of all, it looked at like synthetic fuels. It looked at new engineering and design uh, capabilities that might reduce mass and or reduce surface drag. It looked at new like control surfaces, control surfaces which are seamlessly integrated with the wing so there is no break in the surface. Control surfaces that can curve rather than just fold. Um, so some of these things may ultimately make it onto the flight demonstrator, but I think initially they are going to be working with a pure wing with jet engines. Like um, Boeing, another part of their truss, uh, you know, this program, this concept came from the Sugar Vault, right? The super, so it was a subsonic ultra green aircraft research. And their design had this wing design. It also had jet turbines and electric engine or electric power, which could be used to drive these engines during certain phases of flight. And also apparently could recover energy from the gas turbines. So they could charge up those batteries during certain portions of flight and have the battery power available. And they figured out that between the improvements in the drag and the improvements in the techno other technologies and the engines, they could get a 10 to 30% improvement in fuel efficiency. And that is huge. That is world changing. Flying aircraft is one of those technologies where it's really resistant to not using hydrocarbon fuels because the energy density of these fuels is so much higher than batteries. Cars are a problem that were solved more or less because you can just put in a lot more batteries and have more powerful engines and great, we have viable electric cars for 90% of the applications for which they're used. Aircraft, on the other hand, 
the, you know, I fly an aircraft with a 215 horsepower engine, and that doesn't sound like much. My minivan has more power than my plane, but that plane is running at, you know, 200 plus horsepower for a very long time, whereas that minivan is only <laughs> running <laughs> at 200 and something horsepower when I'm flooring it, trying to take off from the lights and showing that person the so-called muscle car that my minivan can beat them. Yes, it does happen. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so like aviation, they're running at a more or less very high power settings for a very long part of the flight. And that doesn't work in the same way as like a hybrid car, where when you're hitting the brakes, you're recovering energy and then you're putting that energy back in when you're accelerating. The, the real viable long-term way of making aviation more green is to have your synthetic fuels, which can be, which if they can get approved, which they can get mass produced, you can take sun, put them into algae ponds, and somehow get out after the algae, which can be processed down into the kind of hydrocarbons which can, can be burned in jet fuel. So yeah, you know, like biofuels are great. They work on paper, you know, you can do the math, but they're gonna be a very long time coming. For a start, they're gonna be more expensive. And secondly, regulatory agents, re agencies are incredibly risk averse. It's gonna take a long time for them to be very sure that they're gonna risk huge numbers of passengers with 100% biological fuel. Like, it just, just this year, we finally had uh, an unleaded aviation fuel, like, approved for aircraft in the US. It took, it took so damn long for this thing to get finally approved by the FAA. Um, so yeah, I mean, synthetic fuels may actually come and they may actually help improve, uh, you know, the bio, the, you know, the impact. Electric planes, they do exist. Things like the Pipistrelle trainer, which will fly for an hour. And I don't think I've ever had a training flight that lasted less than an hour. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I saw a story last week about someone that took uh, a 1940s design uh, de Havilland beaver. And, you know, I don't know, the beaver, it's this old, like, bush plane. It's all metal and it is tough as nails. Apparently, I, I've read, it's the only plane that came direct from the factory, which included performance specs for flying with, like, a canoe strapped to your landing gear. <laughs> But somebody made an electric version of that. Flies for an hour, it carries passengers for an hour, and, and then it has to land. They're only allowed to fly for, like, they have to have a 30-minute uh, buffer in their power, so they can't fly very far. There are places where electric planes might work. For example, uh, I see FedEx, they have to pick up passenger packages at Petaluma at 6 p.m. every day, fly back to Oakland. That's like a 20-minute flight, if that. But... They have to do this to avoid all the traffic because they want to make sure the packages get there in time for the flight that leaves for Memphis or whatever at you know, 7. So yeah, this is a big part of NASA's whole program and it's going to be fascinating to watch this happen. I hope that Boeing doesn't screw it up. You know, there is real importance to Boeing as a company to make this thing work. Fuel efficiency is hugely important to aviation. Like, if you look, the whole history of passenger jet evolution has really been driving those efficiency numbers up. The early 707, if you look at passenger miles per gallon, you would get about 45 miles per gallon per passenger over the whatever, how many hundred the 707 had. These days, that 45 has gone up to like 120 for the 787s and so on and so forth. So this isn't just like some green thing. This is absolutely what you need to keep an airline manufacturer competitive in a world market. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.